Yeah, so a couple of the projects I wanted to to walk you through. Uh, the first is something that I'm off that I've taught a few times uh, in Basel when doing introduction to programming. Uh, years ago, started doing processing. Uh, had been doing for years after we switched from Action um, F Lash Action Script. And processing is a great tool for getting into code. P5 JS is based on processing. And in that class, we would play with typography. We'd learn how to, to break characters into points. So you could get the points out of a character or letter form. And then we would often use music to interact with it, to make it move, dance, react, uh, based on sound, either a microphone or music. And we would have a little event at the end of it, which is uh, not easy to imagine right now. But we would, yeah, play music and and have a wireless keyboard that you could pass around the room to see how the different uh, letters reacted. So each student, 26 students, 25 students plus myself, would take over a letter and design it and, and decide how it reacts to audio with this keyboard here passing around to, to control, to play VJ and to switch uh, between the letters. A few years later, uh, or maybe a year later, I was slowly experiencing laser projection of RGB lasers. Robert Henke is doing really wild work in this domain. And I couldn't believe the power of a laser, like what kind of light it's capable of compared to a projector, a projected light or a beamer. As a kid, I had one of these devices called a laser FX, uh, which you could plug into a stereo. And it wasn't really a laser. It was just a really bright light where they could, I think I have a video of it here. Um, it's just a little mirror sitting on something like a speaker. So it vibrates and there's some light focused on it and that shoots off into the, into the ceiling and you end up getting these really interesting rubber band like uh, shapes, these different kinds of movements. And so I started wondering, uh, could we play with such a laser with these typographic visuals? Like the laser is great because you have these really bright lines, but you can only draw limited lines. You can't draw full surfaces. So what would happen if we could merge the two together, if we could have sort of fancy complex imagery and a laser going over it? And there were a number of artists who were developing technology for such a laser to be able to talk to it. Memo Atkin was one, uh, making tools for open frameworks. And so I was able to get a, a fairly cheap laser. The prices came down. They're super dangerous. If you play with one, you have to be really careful because um, you have to be far away from your eyes with them. But just put a projector next to a laser and started doing experiments mapping them over one another and exploring, yeah, what would this look like if the two were overlapped? So that was really rough. Then it got a little bit smoother, but realized if it moved too fast, it might not be so synchronized. It worked really well when you move really slow and then just have a little bit of laser instead of having everything light up, just having one of these um, strings or lines glowing had quite a, a nice effect. I'm not sure if you can hear the audio. Do you hear a bit of music? No. Oh, okay. No, no real. Okay. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, in this case, it doesn't matter. Hopefully we don't need music later on. Um, yeah, this is, um, was testing out before what the students would do, playing with with icons and such. And just testing out what does it mean to have a lot of lines that are maybe video projected and just a few of the lines being um, with the laser. So I had built a, a small kind of faux library to make it possible to easily code to the laser. You just put an X in front of everything and then you were drawing lines to the laser. You were sending them from processing to an open frameworks program. And I'll turn off the sound in my ears. Um, and this we called laser letters, which was similar to the previous experiment, but now we got to involve a laser. And so the students created the type per for one letter form. They each created one letter form and we used the same kind of keyboard to switch between them. 
And this was an experiment of both using audio to make the, the letters move, but then to also decide which parts of the letter should be glowing in this laser, because you can't send too much or else the whole thing kind of collapses. Yeah, so I'll let it go through the alphabet and you can see the different forms people made. And all of this is based on it's, it's uh, what we're playing with here is also what we'll play with this week, taking either a letter form or a word, breaking it down to the points that construct that word or letter, and then doing something with those points. So with those points, you're just getting coordinates, an X and a Y, and then it's up to you. Do you draw a line with them? Do you draw circles? Do you draw rectangles? Do you colorize them? Do you add random so they move around? Do you scale them? Here this one gets louder with the audio. We won't necessarily be merging audio with our type this week. Uh, I have a different plan, but it's it's not too tricky to do. It's quite easy to have audio be an input to change your type. Here it's interesting that when you send too many lines, the laser starts to bend. This one did a nice job of using the projected image to kind of leave a, a trace behind of where the laser was. With a lot of points, a lot of repetition, a wild grid. Some wild physics using a, a, another library to handle this motion. Yep, and you can also play in three dimension with any of this stuff. Also in, in P5, we can play in the third dimension. A uh, project that came that we've developed in Basel uh, gave a workshop during this workshop series a couple years ago on was Bazel.js. And Bazel.js is programming in InDesign. Uh, this started with a workshop. We invited Benedict Gross uh, to give a workshop on programming and InDesign for one of our uh, bachelor students doing their thesis. And preparing for the workshop, he realized uh, how much, I mean, he he realized again how much code you needed to talk to InDesign by JavaScript and realized it would be much better to to borrow from a, a library called Processing JS, which was able to convert processing code, this is code in Java, into JavaScript for the browser, and we could use this in InDesign. So we gave a, a workshop, and that started what we then, over a year, developed into this library that you can, it's open source, you can download it, and it lets you do a lot of the things that we're going to do this week in InDesign. I'm going to turn off the volume. And why would you do this in InDesign? Um, for a couple of reasons. You have multiple pages. We're using InDesign all the time for making books as a, as a visual communicator, designer. It might be the tool that you're designing in most. And it has such crazy typographic options. You can change every little detail about type, whereas in most creative coding platforms, uh, frameworks, you can change the font size, maybe the leading, the height of the lines, the font, the point size, um, but not too much else. So it's a really fun environment to, to really do wild type experiments. The downside of it is that it's not a very live environment. It runs, it, it takes a while to, to finish, but then the nice thing is when it's done running, you have these things on the page that then you can keep manipulating and in this case it's done doing this like circle packing algorithm and you can grab the shapes and you can fill them with type and do additional things to them that you can't do in other environments but there's uh we have a very like a hacky mode where we can do live looping but it's not so ideal it's not so fast but this was an example for in one workshop a student wanted to make a generative magazine about screaming so you would yell, and then based on how loud it was, uh, your magazine would have a different font size and and design within within the cover. And so here we found out we could go from processing and grab the microphone and bring it into InDesign in a live way where it's it's rendering this constantly. 
It is a very experimental mode. We've built a couple games for InDesign, which is kind of weird. They're not so useful, but just because you can. And in 2.0, which has been long underway, uh, it will be released sometime soon. Uh, we also have the ability to grab the points of type. This is a newer feature to create outlines and grab those points. And this is especially what we'll focus on this week inside of P5.js. It's much easier to do. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that we can we can do when having two collections of points and merging them with one another. Uh, something completely different is a project looking into uh, using processing and a connect sensor is you may have played this video game. It's now uh, rather old, the original connect. And it's this funny device that let the, you use your body for video games. And so it could capture your, your skeleton. It could like watch you play and build a skeleton and use your body to move and manipulate things. It also has a fun history of people thinking that they're seeing ghosts uh, just based on errors in the tracking data. They sometimes thought there were other people in the room, even though it's probably just a glitch. Um, and in processing, there's also interesting libraries. There's libraries to be able to grab the points from type and to produce type ourselves. And so uh, for a workshop, and then it did it for a few workshops. Uh, this first one started with the theme of the body and typography. I made a little tool that could let you use your body to control points on the type, calling it connect type. And so it was kind of arbitrary which points connected to which parts of the letter, but you could control it. And so for that workshop, borrowed and got a bunch of these connects and we hooked them up to the computer and designed animation. This is a second time doing the workshop um, using your body to, to move letters. And you could also save every font. You could do one letter at a time and save it as a, a body manipulated type, or you could screen record and make animations, animate the type with your body to try and tell a story. Yeah, so it looked like this in the installation. You sort of would press a button and it would be the initial pose and then anywhere you moved from there would move the, the points in different directions. I hope this video is working for everyone. You can see it. Yeah, we can see yes, it. Um, okay, great. Yeah, so this has been used in an in installation style where you stand in front of it and can uh, dance or move or jump and, and see how it moves. Um, it doesn't work so well in a remote workshop, obviously, because we are on our screens and don't have such a setup. Um, another realm of exploration uh, that's kept me, that's obsessed me for the last few years are oscillographics. And this stems out of um, a curiosity of what do things look like outside of our computer screen. So like this is, we have these really nice uh, laptops with really wild screens. They look great. We see our photos in super high res but it's the same screen that we're using when we check our email or go surf the web. And I uh, pretty early on in getting into code, wanted to see the code on something else, something that wasn't so sharp. And so friends had introduced me to a thermal printer. Uh, this is like the receipt printer that you find when you go to buy groceries. And you can do all kinds of fun experiments on these. They, they have 80, meter rolls of paper. So this was an installation at our university that spread across seven floors, seven, seven uh, flights of stairs. And it was a photo booth on one floor and you could add your face to it and it would loop infinitely around. And so eventually you would get over prints and interesting double pictures of two people's faces over each other.
yeah, but this has nothing to do with type, just interesting uh, alternative outputs. Uh, was messing around with pen plotters. And this is a really interesting technology. There's, there's, these are old ones, but there's also new ones called AxiDraw, which you can control with code. And they're quite different than a laptop display because it's a single point. So you're able to draw like you would with a pen. You are drawing with a pen um, and really get to, to view vector graphics as a vector drawing um, on the paper or on a laser or there's there's all these different mediums that really use a X and a Y point. So I had seen these really interesting videos on YouTube, people experimenting with an oscilloscope. Uh, an oscilloscope is a device that's used by technicians to measure electricity and repair radios or TVs. Um, but people learned how to control the graphics on them to send their imagery to it, which blew me away because it has this really interesting glowing green screen and green lines. And this is what they look like. Um, you can send stereo audio to it, so you can watch your music on it, and you can eventually learn to control the thing. This is where it would be nice if you could hear it. I just hear it in my ears. Uh, whoops, I want to go back. Okay, technically, oh, there's the audio. Uh, technically, you you map movement on two different channels. So anything that moves left to right, you send on the left audio channel. And anything that moves vertically, you move to the right channel. And like this, it's possible to control these screens through audio, which is a very strange thing that you're you're turning an image into audio and then uh, that audio becomes an image once it's on the device. And because it's audio, you can mix it with different audio effects. So this was running through some kind of an effects pedal. You can send 3D graphics and everything has this unique analog warm glow to it that's so much different than our computer screens are. So in this project, I ended up making a library. This is out there called XY Scope. If you learn processing or eventually you can take your skills that we learned this week in P5 and you can apply them to processing, which is Java based. And there are virtual oscilloscopes, but you can also find them um, on eBay for under $50. And with this library called XY scope, you basically just put an XY in front of these basic shapes, like a line, a rect, an ellipse, and that sends it to be converted into sound so that you can you can see it on these displays. So this was the teaser for the library, the first version of it in 2017, in the summer of 2017. It's now been updated. It has smoother drawing. It has more examples. You can do, um, you can control a laser with it. It's been updated for, for controlling lasers. And I'll scroll through a little bit. Uh, how about a fancy example? So it comes with examples to be able to draw with the mouse and you can do handwritten typography, for example. It has examples for bringing in a connect, the same sensor from the previous project. And so I'm often using this for installations, uh, grabbing the silhouette of the visitor and then combining it in different ways. I'll show you a project uh, after this in which type was used. You can grab the webcam. And this is all being done by taking a video image or uh, this depth camera and converting it to a line using something called OpenCV, Open Control Computer Vision. And from that line, then you can convert it to audio, which gets sent to this device. It sounds really interesting. Uh, I can send you a link to go hear what these things sound like. Yeah, and you can do all kinds of fun typography in, in three-dimensional space. We can do this in P5 as well. Uh, this was just an example of how the 
the library looks. It doesn't need very much code to already be able to send these kinds of graphics. It's just about five lines of code. And this is what it looks like on a number of different installations. Uh, there's an event in South Korea called Typo Jonji, uh, where I was invited to, to make an installation with these. And the theme was body and typography again. And so I wanted to figure out a way to, to combine typography and letter forms. And these, these screens are really small. As you can see here, they're only a few inches by a few inches big. And so they were really interested to see if we could make them much bigger and project them somehow. And so I was doing experiments on using a, a Fresnel lens to try and enlarge it, hoping that we could get them about a meter by a meter large. But the problem is you need complete darkness in order for that to work, and it just wasn't going to be possible in the space. And so instead, we we spread them out, just had them on their pedestals, their little tables. And it's really interesting that people do come close to them to, to see what's happening. It doesn't matter that it's this little display. People are really curious what's happening in there. And here's an example of what this uh, this installation was. Basically, you stood in front of the Xbox Connect on the first one. It captures a couple seconds of your motion. It, you could move in front of it, wave your hands, anything. And then this signal gets combined with the signal of typography. So here it's a T. It was just a S. And basically, you can do really weird things combining um, multiple signals with each other at different frequencies. So here it's typography is the dominant signal and the person's body is being combined at a really high frequency at a low volume. And so then you get yourself animated as a texture on that letter form. And on the last station, you just got to see yourself again in a loop until somebody else walked into the installation and overran uh, that that loop. This is essentially what's happening in the background. This is what it, the, the computer sees when you're standing in front of it. This is getting converted into lines, which then get converted into waves, and typography gets combined with it, and in the end, uh, we get these these special combinations happening. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of different vector displays. This is basically a little input on on just alternative displays, ways that we can use creative code outside of the computer, from the computer, but to control other devices. This is a Vectrex, uh, an old video game system, which you, with tutorials and being super, super careful, can open up and modify. And it has a really special quality of a line. It's a large display about nine inches, 10 inches across. And it has these sort of spaghetti-like white lines, which offer um, yeah, quite a unique display. This would be nice if we heard the sound, but I can send you a link to this video. Um, this is for every two years for the last four years, there's been a gathering called Vector Hack. So if you're into oscillographics, lasers, uh, there's a small community, but intense community dedicated to this stuff. And we, we've we gathered and exchanged our libraries, our codes, our techniques, playing on these weird devices. And this is just an interesting thing that you can do with typography. So this was a little trailer I made where I have type normal letters, but then I'm sending different frequencies onto those letter forms, which cause them to manipulate in these really strange ways, which I would have no idea how to program. So it's like I, I get these outputs by knowing how to program the type and knowing how to produce a sound. And then that gives me a surprising form in the end that I wouldn't know. I would I have no idea how to make something like, yeah, like where are these crazier looking ones? Like so that it's kind of type, kind of manipulated, would be really tricky to program directly. Yeah, as I mentioned, you can also control a laser. And uh, this is a, a really interesting device because they're, they're RGB 
so you can control the colors of them in motion over time opens up all sorts of possibilities you have to be so careful because they're really bright uh, so you have to really keep your eyes far away from them but i i had just finished developing the laser aspect for this xy scope library so that one could control um, a laser for example with this system um, and then I got distracted into a thing called P5 Live, which is what we're going to be playing with and what I'll introduce you to now. So yeah, let me bring you into P5 Live. So those are different kinds of uh, also physical creative coding where we need devices, we need rooms, we need installations. Um, and just as I was getting into that laser stuff, a uh, new project sort of um, became an obsession uh, which is what we're going to play with now and which fortunately works so well at a distance in remote situations. Uh, so you hopefully have all heard about processing. This is something that's been around since early 2000s, came out 2001 or two. It's an iteration from Design by Numbers from John Maida. And it's basically, it's it's in Java and it's a framework that makes it really approachable for artists and designers to be able to code. And so it was the tool for, it still is, the tool for getting into creative coding uh, at a really uh, simplified, abstracted level where so many functions that you need for doing creative visual things are there for you. So you don't need too many lines of code to have a really impressive um, complex outputs. Uh, uh, in 2000, late 2000s, a uh, project called Processing JS was released uh, in order to help people bring their processing sketches, which are Java, into the browser. So you used to be able to run Java in the browser and people would, would run their sketches, but slowly browsers stopped allowing Java because it had security issues and um, yeah, there were all sorts of, oh, we can interact with the fishy. Uh, there were all sorts of problems with, with allowing Java to run in the browser. And so this uh, tool processing JS figured out a way to let you sort of drag and drop your processing sketch, which is Java, and they could convert that code into JavaScript to control the HTML5 canvas. And what is a canvas? That's what this thing is here. That's what this thing is up here. And it's this really rich sandbox that lets us do all kinds of wild interaction. Something pretty wild is I'm loading this page right now from archive.org. This is like a, a snapshot of how the website used to look a year ago, almost to the day. Um, and in the meantime, they, they closed the website because the project ended uh, around 2012 or 13, no, a little later, um, it got replaced by P5.js, which we'll talk about. But this library is still super capable. I'm still using it for the back of my website, which is now which is now getting old. Uh, I made this in 2014 or so, and it's using visual feedback uh, to let you do a, yeah, sort of. Uh, generative graphics in the back end. And this is using this processing JS. So this was originally a processing sketch that then I could display in the browser. And uh, yeah, it's fortunately still running strong. I haven't changed the code to, to this newer P5.js. It's still using this older setup. But in around 2013, I believe, P5.js showed up on the scene from Lauren McCarthy. And essentially it was an attempt to rebuild processing for JavaScript, which has become the dominant programming language uh, for the browser. It's so powerful what it can do. And it's much easier to learn than Java. It's way more forgiving for, for students to get into code. And so, um, 
this is uh, the tool that we'll be using. It's it's has a great mission statement to really make sure that everyone, all backgrounds, all abilities can program and participate in code. And they've really done a great job at making sure it's as as um, friendly uh, workflow as possible. So two years ago in Basel, we organized a processing community day. It was processing community day is something that the processing community organized both in LA and around the world. Any city could organize a community day where we had workshops and talks. And at the end, we wanted to have a party like a DJ and, and code because um, there's an interesting movement um, niche called algo raves. And these are, maybe you've experienced one, these are uh, concerts, performances in which code is creating either or both the music and the visuals. And you often see the code that's creating those things. And so it's algo for algorithmic and rave for rave. And you can watch the process as it happens. So you can usually see the code and and see the person changing things. And if you know how to read a bit of code, it's even more exciting because then you can recognize, oh, that fancy trick they did. And oh, that's what I'm hearing or seeing in front of me. There is a really interesting project out there called Hydra. I can recommend. And this is a visual synthesizer that doesn't require very much code to do some pretty wild visuals or very wild visuals. It's like a video synthesizer in your browser uh, from Olivia Jack. And this is a live coding environment. And so while you are changing stuff, you see it happening right away in the background. And that's something I should mention about this algo rave. It's really unique in that it's live coded. So in most of the previous projects I showed you, you write a bunch of code, you run it, it works. You stop it from running, you write a bunch of code, you run it, it works or it doesn't work. And you have this, this relationship of starting and stopping your code constantly. And in these live coding environments, you just everything you type gets updated on the fly as you type it if you want it to. And so you have a really fast um, input reaction, input reaction to what you're coding. So Based on these different inputs, we, we wanted to be able to live code the visuals at this party uh, on our community day. And so I started to put together sort of a hack of being able to have a P5.js visuals on one layer, full screen, an editor, full screen that could sit over it. And then it slowly developed into a whole sort of tool that can keep track of your sketches, and can do all sorts of other fancy features. And this is uh, what's become P5 Live, I call it. So this is actually, we're two times inside of P5 Live. This is a weird meta view. I'm giving you a presentation inside of P5 Live where I can also interact with the thing. And so P5 Live is essentially an, an editor and a way that we can use P5.js this, this um, like processing for the browser. But the benefit is that we have the ability to go through and change stuff on the fly. So I can go and say, oh, I want this, um, this fill to be this, this, and now one of those shapes there is red. We can see it just instantly changed. Or I'll go here and say 0, 255, and now this text is pink or I can get rid of that, make that zero, and now it's blue, or add 255, and now it's an aqua, and everything I do is being instantly updated if I want it to, so we can really quickly see the code, make some changes, hide the code, and see what effect that has on our visuals. So this worked for a party. We had a really fun event. People could come up. We had a couple of computers and people could join and, and learn how to code or, or test things out and play with other people's code. And soon after, had the idea it would be really nice if we could code together remotely. So we're really used to this by using things like Google Docs. I'm sure a handful of you have worked on a document together with each other on the internet. 
There are things called etherpads or Google Docs where multiple people are on the same document changing things. And I was really curious about what if we could do this together and have a bunch of people coding at once and see the same visuals with each other. So either locally, like sitting in the same room, jamming with someone or across the web uh, anywhere in the world with someone else. And this became co-coding, um, a feature that I introduced, I believe, in the early summer or, or maybe late spring 2019. And essentially, this is an early version of it, but we can see on the right, there are people in the room and both people can type. Uh, and so you can you can really collaborate with someone else and both people see the same output on each of their computers and just this code here gets synchronized. Yeah, so here it's drawing a 3D teacup, adding some rotation and some fancy shading, adding a loop, and then adding a bunch of them to, to spin around and scale and mess with each other. This is the little promo teaser for this thing. And we'll end up doing quite a bit of this uh, because yeah, I made this in 2019, and then it was just fun to be able to collaborate with people on the internet. It wasn't a necessity. And then COVID happened, and suddenly we find ourselves in remote classrooms, remote teaching, and this has become a really useful tool for my own teaching uh, to be able to, to work with students and have students work with each other inside of this environment. So this is what it looks like today. Uh, it's had quite a bit of updates since then where a bunch of us we can sit in a room together and we can chat with each other now there's a little chat box and we can uh, take turns um, all typing or what i often do is i lock the room so that we can't all just type and create chaos but we can take turns adding code removing code and and collaborating and then this environment works really well, just two people at a time to code with each other rather than having to work alone and, and be totally lost. Um, yeah, so what I ended up doing and what we'll do as well, this is the page for um, for teaching for my teaching P5JS. This was how it was there. We create, I create sort of a, a faux breakout session for each of you to code together in, and we can click on those. Maybe I don't need to show this, I'll just do it later. Uh, and that brings us into a room where we can code together. I'll do that later. Yeah, and so how, how can P5.js be used? Um, whoops, for, for fancy things. I mean, this is just a, one example, I'll show you other examples over the week, but this is maybe a most recent one uh, with my first year bachelor students where we built little tools that reacted with type, uh, not sorry, not with type, with historical uh, media art with graphic user interface sliders. And so they had a, an image that had been made in the, from pioneers in computer graphics, this is from 1960, they had to recreate and then using uh, graphic user interface sliders, building little tools to customize their code. And this is what I want to especially work with, with you all with, is uh, we'll develop typography, generative typography. We'll learn how to, to put text on a page. We'll learn how to grab the points from that text to control it and do strange manipulations. And then it's really interesting when we start adding a few sliders, especially when we style them and decide where they should go. But basically all of this code, this is the code for this particular sketch that we see. Any number in your code can become a slider or you can use your mouse to control it. And that way we can create little custom tools to to modify our code and to give us to sort of turn what was just a little sketch into actually we maybe don't need Photoshop or some of these other or Illustrator. Instead, you can code your output and, and build yourself a custom 
interactive environment and and then it just needs a little button at the bottom to say save and it saves that picture to your downloads. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Yeah, one other example of using this co-coding was in a class I taught with the master students uh, called Alt Outputs. And this was focused on, like those examples I showed you before, using code and processing to control anything besides the laptop screen. And so a former student had used, um, had a, managed to acquire and focused on these train signs, which um, used to be at every train station in Switzerland. They're now slowly, sadly being replaced by LCD displays, so digital displays. And what's quite interesting is, oops, waiting for a, a thing to go by, um, I believe it's in Poland that the one of the main manufacturers that's still producing these is based in Warsaw, a little bit outside of Warsaw. There's some really interesting sign technology um, where the only producer for it, especially these little flip dots and mechanical digits are being produced in Poland. So they managed to get a lot of these devices by through tons and tons of calls, going to a recycle center, figuring out how to talk to it with an Arduino, eventually getting it to, to work and they could control these things by sending their own signal to it. And I wanted to have them come give a workshop uh, in the course. And the really tricky thing was this is such a physical device. How could we talk to this in a remote way? Because everyone has to be at home in remote learning. And so it ended up working inside of co-coding. We could uh, work together and send code to this device and we could embed a YouTube live stream of a camera pointed at it behind our code. And that way everyone could sort of, we could take turns programming to this device, controlling what it says, and a split second later seeing the update of it. So this is what it looked like being able to do this kind of weird remote collaboration. Yeah, and so that became then an example where we could embed that video I showed earlier of co-coding. This is the code now to, to embed it as a background of our sketch. And then here I have this little coffee cup that I can draw over that video. So we can do some really weird, I can clear it if I don't want to see it tracing. And I can say, okay, there's your cup of coffee right there next to you. Or I don't clear it and then I get to draw with this thing on my screen. So there's so many weird, weird things that we can do. And this environment, this P5 Live is essentially one way, there's multiple ways that you can use P5JS, but it's a way that's focused on VJN, so making live graphics, full screen, audio reactive if you want it, and especially this ability to collaborate with one another remotely. I'm going to switch to uh, p5live.org where I'm going to start a co-coding session. Maybe before we jump into um, before we jump into learning how the code works, I just want to do a quick demonstration with you. Great, quite a few of you are there. Perfect. You're already learning how to change your name. Yep, you can just click on your that your name is at the very top of the list. You can just click on it, and you can give yourself a new name and color if you want, or you can keep your normal penguin. You can keep your name um, as you are assigned. Okay, and what are we doing? We're here inside of a shared space where if I just do something like say, ellipse, mouse X, mouse Y, 50. Ooh, strange, how did an O appear there? Hopefully everyone <clears throat> is able to draw with their mouse. I'll recompile it once. Is everyone able to control these shapes on their screen? Yeah, yeah. we are. Awesome. Yeah, so I did the coding here, and um, <clears throat> what I'm coding here is happening on your screen. If I want to totally be a control freak, I can press this broadcast button, and now I can uh, clear the screen, and I should be drawing on your computer screen. 
and hopefully it's looking like it's saying hello. And this is sharing my mouse X and Y, my computer mouse position with yours. And so I'm able to draw on your screen, but I'll turn that off so that and clear it so that you can draw. And basically, uh, let me make the code a little bigger. This is a P5 sketch. We have a setup at the top. This code runs once. So I'll put a little comment here and say, this code runs once at the start. And down here, this code runs um, around 60 times per a second. This is our looping code. I would say it runs loops at about 60 times a second. Um, and so this is the fun animation space where we really want to be playing and we can do all kinds of things. I can say, let's make the fill blue. And now your circle should become blue. And we can do all kinds of different things. I can say, um, I'm actually going to make this thing small. So it's a, a tiny dot in this live coding. When the code can compile, it will and it doesn't need to trash everything that's there. But if I want, I could fade things out. I could have a background that's black with five opacity, and now you should see everything slowly fading away out of view. If I go, I'll bring the fill back to white. Um, we can play with things like random. So right now we're using our mouse to move the display around. One person here figured out how to request to edit. Alec, I will trust you for a second and let you code. And maybe you want to go change some value in our code. I can see where your cursor is. If you put your mouse over the user list, then you can see where the people's cursors are. All right, so now we have a shade of gray. Great. Yeah, if you want to go ahead and change another value to see what happens. Maybe you want to change the, the size of our circle or something else. All right, now it's bigger. It's 56 pixels big. Yeah, and up here on the background, I can change this value. Right now it's 5. Yeah, so 20 is going to be a shade of gray. And with this, the second value is the opacity. How 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 much can we see this layer? So when it's a low number, then we barely see it. When it's a higher number, we see it a lot. So if this is 125, we don't leave any trace. We only have a little bit of a glow happening behind our, our shape. If I go 255 is the highest number we could give it, and then it's completely opaque. We can't see through it at all, so we only see the circle exactly where it is because every frame we're, we're covering up whatever had been there with a new background. So if I go back to a low number, then we can start to leave a trace behind. Okay. Yep. Thanks for adding those. I'm going to turn off your coding for a sec. So this first number is about the color. It's about a shade of gray if it's a single value. So if I give one value, it's a shade of gray from white. I'm going to make all your screens really bright to black zero. So we have these shades from zero to 255 for, for shades of gray. A second value is, like I mentioned, the opacity. How much can we see this thing? Either just a little bit, so it leaves a long trace. Um, or it's very opaque and we, we barely leave a trace at all. If we give three values I showed earlier, then we're playing with R, G, B. So then we're playing with uh, three colors mixed together. Each one of them can go from 0 to 255. Okay, but let's go back to just having a slight background. And I just want to show you how quickly we can turn let me make this instead of being following my mouse. Uh, here I'm using mouse uppercase X. This is known as a variable. We heard about these a little bit while we introduced our, each other. 
This is a variable that's built into P5, and it knows exactly where our mouse is on the document. And the X refers to left and right, and Y refers to up and down. So when we draw a circle, we have to tell it where horizontally, and then we tell it where vertically, and I'm using our mouse position for those values. If I want, I'll make another one that uses random. So we let the computer decide some of these things. And I'll make it a little bit bigger. And maybe I'll let it trace a little bit longer. And like this, I'll turn off our drawing one. And now I'll leave it on. This is doing something similar. It's actually, actually it's completely different. Um, instead of telling it to be where our mouse is, it's saying, give me a random number based on the width. So width and height are also two great variables that were given right out of the box that automatically know how big our canvas is. How wide is it? How tall is it? And what if you give it random width and, for example, mouse Y? Yep, yep, let's do it. Mouse Y, mouse X. So what random does is it gives you, a. if you only give one value, it's zero up to that value. So like this is right now, um, you, can, you can hide your code by pressing Control E. Control E turns on and off the code. Uh, an English E. And so with my mouse being that value, if I make my mouse maybe up to here, then I can see those random dots. I'll clear the screen on everyone. Now those random dots are only allowed to get as big as my mouse X and Y are. Does that make sense? So if I give this the number 50 by 50 and clear the screen. If I hide my code, there I can see I have a little cluster of dots because they're only allowed to get up to 50 pixels across. So by using something like, uh, whoops, I want to use height for my Y position, width for my horizontal position, um, I can let a random number be decided for me across the whole page. And this is drawing a circle. If I want to draw some text, I can, I'll just show you, because we're going to be playing with typography, I just want to write hello to you, give it a random width, random height. Uh, I actually don't need to give any size. And I'll hide our circles fade out our background for a minute. Maybe I'll make it darker. And then maybe even turn off our background. Or actually, I'll turn it on for a sec, make sure everyone's code is at that level. And now this should be saying, hello, 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 all over your screen. I can set the text size and say random 1 to 25 or 50, and we should be getting different sizes, hellos, all over our screen. Is that working for, do people see what I see? Yeah, it works. Great. Yep. Great. Yeah, so hopefully this is just a super quick insight. Um, woo! Um, yep, somebody found the chat. <laughs> Yeah, so this is uh, just a super quick insight, how little code we need to make fancy things happen. Here we have, uh, this code doesn't count, set up and draw don't count, because they have to be there. This, we need to create canvas to tell this thing how big to be. I could make a small canvas, but like this, it's fun to play full screen. And we have four lines of code, and we're already able to make generative type all over the page. Crazy, crazy. We don't need, um, there's there's infinite amounts of code we can learn. We'll learn quite a few of the basics uh, to be able to do fancy controlled things. But what's really fun in this environment, P5.js, is how little we need to make a lot happen. 
Yeah, so before we get into that, are there questions from your side? Uh, just, I just yeah. wanted to ask uh, if I was the only one who had some kind of delay because I saw I saw that you were changing your code, but uh -huh. like right now I see just black screen. I don't see this. Oh, okay. Let me do a hard compile. Now do you see? Yeah, now I see it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Um, yeah, I think once I jump into the class, um, this was the segue. But yeah, I'll walk you through this whole tool because there's definitely some settings that we need to make sure <clears throat> that we adjust to to have this work the best for us because maybe it could be possible it wasn't automatically compiling or maybe if it wasn't the application in the front it wasn't updating on its own and i have the ability from my end to say refresh the screen on everyone to recompile the code it's called mm -hmm. yep other questions Not yet, I think. Okay. I give a minute in case there's any any spontaneous questions. Well, I'm pretty sure we'll have some later on. Okay. Okay, people want to start coding and learning how to code. Yeah, so what I recommend we do is, um, yeah, so essentially this is a, this is the co-coding environment, and this is the space where we can all meet together. But what we'll be doing quite a bit this week is just being two people in a room, um, maybe coding with a partner, which I'll randomly decide and assign you. And that way you can, you can, uh, work together right now you've all been locked so you couldn't do anything um, just because with such a large group it's easy to have a bunch of errors appear but being two people uh, you can chat you can um, take turns adding code it's gonna break at times I'll introduce an error if I misspell this and say text uh, everything just stopped for everyone I'm guessing and then I will add the T and fix it it may be started working again, or I'll tell you the command uh, as we get into this tool for how to how to recompile the code it's called. Okay, for the class, uh, I'll copy this link into Teams chat. This is the URL for, uh, how do I do this? Uh, make it smaller. Reply, I guess. There we go. This is the link for our workshop where all of our inputs are that we'll slowly walk through. So I have one question. Sure. Uh, you, you've just said that the partners are going to be randomly assigned, but can we work with a particular person if we have uh, agreed on this or not? Sure. It'll just make my life complicated. Um, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I have a, I have it set up so that it randomly assigns the people. Maybe, did it happen to assign you to the person that you wanted to work with? Maybe not. How to check that? Uh, look at my screen or look at Teams. No, it might not have. Um, yeah, we can talk about this today. Maybe... Um, if we want to work with particular people, then then I'll try to adjust this so that we can pair people up manually. It just might be tricky at a distance uh, that it's harder to sit right next to to a particular person. But yeah, we can try to have uh, manual partners. Um, yeah, so this is the website. Maybe have a look. Let's pause this co-coding session. And if you want to look at Teams, then you'll see the page that I'm sharing. And basically this is where we'll find the inputs that we'll walk through with the code. Uh, we're gonna focus on generative design, typography. Hopefully we'll have enough time to get into graphic user interfaces and building little tools. 
And this course is going to be just about taking a lot of little steps to get you into code, because that's how we learn programming. We have to take lots of little steps and lots of little practice in order to, to learn this. It's a new language. Um, yeah, there's a code of conduct. I borrow the one from P5JS. I recommend having a look at later. It's just a helpful guide of how to be thoughtful to one another, which I'm sure will be anyways. I ask you, please try to, to avoid using your cell phone out of um, habit. We're super addicted to these things, so just try to ignore it unless needing to ask help from each other in the class. But it's good to take a break from this thing. We're already going to have so much screen time. And if possible, it's really great when you're able to have your, your cameras on um, while we meet, just so I can see some feedback, especially when I'm um, walking you through some some code and through some steps. It's really helpful to know if I see really confused faces and it's making sense or not. Yeah, but basically let's let's get set up and installed. So hopefully you have a special way of setting up the screens so that you can, uh, I'm going to close this screen. I think we can go ahead and close this co-coding session for now because we don't need to code together at the beginning. What I want to first do is have you set up and, and show you what it is like um, coding directly on your own display. So I just closed the co-coding session and under setup, it shows you the different ways in which we can use P5. So at the, I'll start at the bottom, the two things we won't necessarily be doing. You can download P5.js and start it as a project from scratch for, for using in a website um, or just directly using it. They have an online editor, which is a great tool for having assets and seeing the code side by side, and you can share, you can save and share these sketches with friends. Uh, but what we'll be using is this unique environment, this P5 Live, for especially using it with co-coding, and there's a bunch of other features that it has that we'll take advantage of. So there's two ways that we can use P5 Live. We can use it online by just going to p5live.org. So I open that up in a new tab. And you will see when you first load it, you should see something like this, just a, a blank canvas with code. We can also install it offline on our computers. We can do this later on. And the advantage of doing this is that you can run P5 Live with the internet completely turned off. So it's possible to use somewhere where they have no internet. Um, maybe you don't want to have to be connected to the internet. Maybe you want to, especially if you want to load local assets it's a a good way to use it for loading custom fonts and images but we we don't need to do that just yet the first thing we should do is um, open up this p5 live in a tab and you should see it similar to this you may not have the numbers visible right from the start but does everyone have this um, i don't know if you're still in the co-coding session has everyone opened it up in a fresh tab to see something like this? Yeah. Yes. Great. Uh, one big, big, big warning. P5 Live will warn you as well to not have this open in multiple tabs. If I open it up a second time, you get this warning saying, it's open multiple times, close one to avoid data loss. Why is that important? Because everything that we do in P5 Live is being saved in our local storage, it's called, of the browser. So I'm not storing anything in the cloud. I'm really storing it only on your computer. If I, I just show you real quick, if I go to application, local storage, this website, just to show you on my, on my computer, these are my sketches uh, that are sitting there along with my settings. So everything is on your computer and the problem is if you have it open in multiple tabs, you can easily overwrite some of the data in one tab, and then you go back to the other tab, and it doesn't have this information. Um, so you need to make sure that 
you only have this open once to avoid any data. I see the, the in the chat, you have a frozen screen. Yeah, I just couldn't see what, what you were doing, but I think now it's all right. Okay, great. Yeah, so, so this is P5 Live, and uh, let me just quickly walk you through how things are, where we find things. So at the very top, there's about, you probably got a pop-up like this the very first time you opened it. And if you take the time uh, and, and really want to know all about it, everything you need to know about this tool is here. I doubt anyone reads this whole thing, but there are tons of features packed in there uh, that you can slowly walk through yeah, as you need uh, to learn how this thing works. The most important are the shortcuts to be able to do things on our code, which I'll walk you through. Next to the about is the settings. And here, there's a couple really important things we should adjust. Let's make sure that live coding is turned on. And what this means is when I lift my key after pressing new code, half a second later, it'll try to compile this code for me. It's up to you if you have echo render on or off. When you're co-coding with a friend, it's good to have it off. And what this means is, uh, it should the code keep running, if it's not the, the window that you have currently in focus, that you're currently on. So it's actually maybe for, for this week, it's good to have it off. So it's always running and we can always see stuff happening, but eventually it might be good to activate if you're doing a bunch of multitasking. Uh, the cursor is usually on, these things are on. Menu tab is usually on. This is a little thing that lets you open and close uh, this menu. Um, basically, the control key to, to open this thing is control M, control key and M, open and close this menu, control comma shows this settings. Uh, and line numbers I would recommend turning on. Whoops, for some reason these settings are not changing. Strange, I don't know why that's not adjusting things. Uh-oh, I wonder if I broke something recently. For okay. Me. Working. For you, it's working? Yeah. Yeah, great. it works. Okay, great. It works. I wonder if I broke something on my end. I'm going to reset my settings because I don't think I... Just to be safe, I'm going to export my settings and then reset my settings. And line numbers... Oh, no, strange. Weird. No idea why it's not working for me. Whoops. Okay. Strange. I'll have to figure out what's going on on my screen. Um, yeah, these are just different different settings that we can adjust and turn on and off. Um, down here, the shortcuts. If some of you are on a PC, I recommend changing this shortcut here, this, con this cursor toggle control C, because you need control C probably to copy and paste code. So if you're on a Windows on PC, or on Linux, uh, you should click once on this this uh, section, cursor toggle, and give it a new key, maybe control shift C, just press a new combination, and that'll overwrite the, the shortcut so that you have control C back for copying. That's really important. Okay, I'm gonna hide my settings. Um, yeah, so so what is happening here? We have this co-coding window we'll look at later. Here we store our sketches. Again, all the sketches are only living in your browser. So it's really important that every once in a while we export everything. But when I make a new sketch, I press this little new button. It loads new from the demos, which we can check out later. And let's just type something. Let's let's do a let's make um, in a lip, no, it's, we played with ellipse earlier. I showed you an ellipse. Let's make a rectangle, it's called. Rect, R-E-C-T. And let's say... And let's tell this rectangle to be our mouse X, big X, comma, mouse Y, big Y, 15. I take it back, 25. And we should see this thing moving around on your screen. 
And what happened is on the right side, you'll see uh, new became new with an underscore, maybe underscore 01 for you. And if you put your mouse over these little three dots on the right, you'll see we have the ability to inspect this code. We can rename this sketch. We can export it and we can trash it. So what we should maybe do is give this thing a fresh name and say, let's rename this and call this uh, basic shapes. I'm going to give this a, a prefix so that I can keep things separate. And I'm going to say, OK, I'm just going to call this thing basic shapes. And now I have a name for this sketch so that I can keep track of what it is. Because just calling things new, new, new isn't very helpful or useful for us. OK, so hopefully you could rename this thing. I just walk you through a couple of the other buttons we need to know about. We can clone the sketch, which is really great for just doing like a save as. So if we have something great and we want to make changes but keep what we have, you just press this clone sketch, and now I have the exact same thing, but with an underscore one. So now I could, on this page, I could make this big or huge, 200. So this is a big square, but if I go to that other sketch, it's the little square. So these are similar, but different. They're totally unique sketches. Um, and so that's a nice way that you can just keep iterating and iterating. You don't have to always overwrite your code. You can decide to um, you can decide to make little little saved iterations. Ah, I just saw Ava said hello, hello Ava. If you're still in the room with us, yeah. So this is how we can can create our sketches. Um, just so you know, every time you press your every time you change your code and type in things, it's saving this. So every there is no save. Every key change saves your code for better or worse. If you break your code and you close the window, you can't undo anymore. So it's good to keep your sketch open. If you break something, we can always undo and bring it back before it was broken, or we have to find the bug. But everything is being constantly saved as we type, but only in our browser. So this is really important. If you like to clear your browser data, you might lose all your sketches. So maybe this week it's good not to clear this and make sure that we're saving everything. Um, across the top, I showed you we could clone. We can build a folder if we want to be really organized and throw things into the folder. You can organize yourself as you, as you need for these sketches. We can import sketches and we can export all sketches. So I have the ability to export a folder full of sketches, or I can export a single sketch it just downloaded, and it becomes a file that I can trade to, to anyone. You can pass each other these files. You can drag and drop them into P5 Live, and then they show up in your sketches. So this is a way that you can, this export all sketches is a good way to back everything up to make sure you should really do this maybe once a day just to make sure you don't lose anything. And to change sketches, we just click on the name of these other sketches. So I can jump between different sketches that I have just by clicking on those names. You can also click and drag and rearrange them. Maybe before I ask for questions, I should make sure uh, we know how, that I show you how all these things work. So there's a bunch of shortcuts that are really, really useful to know. The main ones are on this page here, on this getting started or this setup for P5 Live. Control N brings you to a new sketch. Control Enter, Control plus Enter, is how we do what's called a soft compile. So that can force the thing, if it doesn't already do it, to, to recompile the code if if it's already recompiled the code, then that ends up doing a, a brand new compile. And what does that mean to compile? It means we're changing code and we're asking the computer to execute that code again. But by default, we have our settings on live coding. And so it's, it's doing this automatically for us all the time. Um, if, if it seems like things aren't working and it's really surprising and you've tried compiling, we can add shift 
to that combination. And that does what's called a hard compile. Control, shift, enter. Really make sure that everything is recompiled. And this is maybe a good thing to do if things aren't working and you're not quite sure why. Try doing a hard compile. Otherwise, just control enter should be enough to make sure that things works. And this especially is necessary if I break my code there. Now I have red lines. I still see something, but if I were to open up the sketch once, um, I go away from it, I come back, things are not working until I fix my code, and then I should press control enter once to recompile. So, so write this down, keep it a note, control enter is super important for recompiling. Control E turns our code on and off. So this is also really important. We can hide the code and show the code like so. Control E, yeah, lets us, lets us show the code and hide the code. And at times it's nice to hide the code just to play with what you have. And then you maybe you want to see the code and make a change. So maybe before our rectangle, let's add a background that is zero. And let's look at the difference of this. When I have background zero, then this I only have one square because what's happening? I'm drawing a black background, I'm drawing a square, and then I'm putting a background on top of it and drawing a square and putting a background on top of it and drawing a square. And so with a background, um, it, it only shows us the latest drawing, but then it keeps covering up whatever had been there before. We can turn code on and off by using two forward slashes. So if I put two slashes in front of it, now I get to trace that rectangle like I had before. So try that out. Add the background, and then add two slashes, and then take away the two slashes, and bring the background back, and everything goes away, because now we're, we're clearing the screen constantly. So control E turns our code on and off. Control M, I mentioned before, turns our menu on and off. We can, we can show and hide the menu on demand. So it's nice to control M. You just have to remember M for menu. It can be really nice to get that thing out of the way when we're not, when we're not setting the name of the sketch and all that, I hide the thing so that we have the full play, the full window to play with. A cheap way to clear the screen without having a background. If you drew a bunch of shapes and you want to get rid of them, just press control enter to recompile or shift enter to do control shift enter to do a hard recompile. And then you um, get to just clear everything that had been there. Any other shortcuts? Control comma opens up the settings. Control T is useful to automatically tidy our code. If things are kind of not looking so nice, control T will tidy it up. I started to hear a microphone. Did someone have a question? Yeah, I have a question. What to do if Control N opens new Chrome tab, not new sketch? Ooh, interesting. Yep. Yeah. Then what we should do is change that shortcut under settings. Go back under your open up the menu. And then go to your settings and go down to this menu toggle and click on it and give it a new key, like maybe Control Shift M. Try another command key to to be able to toggle the menu with a different uh, keystroke. If this one works, uh, I was talking about new sketch. Ah, new sketch. Ah, true. Then you can also change that down below. A little further down is new okay. sketch. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, PC people. Um, I'm on a Mac, and so my Control key was available. But if I'm accidentally ruining a bunch of keys or keys that do stuff in Chrome, just go through and customize these things. Maybe while we're in the settings, it's also worth showing you, you can manually press backup. Because if you have to change the settings on your P5 Live, it'll also be worthwhile to be able to, to export all those settings as well, your sketches and these settings, so you don't have to do it again 
And there's a backup button here. You just press backup now and it downloads a file. I'll show you. It downloads a file that doesn't do us much good to look at. It's just a fancy file, but it has all of our sketches and it has our settings. And that way you can drag and drop this file into P5 if you ever have to reset it or, or change browsers. I'll explain more about that later, switching from one browser to another. Other questions? Mm, you are changing the color like like to the one, but there is possible, I think there is to like change the hue. So while we are moving the mouse, the, the shapes are changing of the, the RGB. Sure, sure. You're tired of just having a plain white square on a background. Yep, if you want color, we can use fill. So uh, I just repeat for everyone, this, this setup happens once. It initiates any code that we want just once. And then this draw is where the code happens a bunch of times. So here I'm having a bunch of times a background. By default, this square has a white fill and a black stroke. And then I'm drawing the rectangle. Anytime we want to style things, we need to do it before we draw our shape. So to follow along with this, we can jump to basics number one. Uh, maybe real quick before we before we look at fill, because um, the question was, can we have the, the color of the square change as we move our mouse? Of course. Uh, let's open up this cheat sheet in a separate tab. So if you go to basics, at the top is cheat sheet. I hold down command and open that in a new tab. And this can be a good document to download maybe so that you can mark it up digitally. Uh, but this has a lot of the things that we'll need, more than we'll need, um, but a lot of useful things, including, I'll zoom into it, whoops, reset actually, and zoom in digitally here. If I scroll down a bit, here's some basic shapes that we can draw, and here's how we can stylize things. So here we have a background, we can tell things to have a fill or no fill, a stroke or no stroke. And what we need to do, so this is the cheat sheet I would keep open in, in somewhere on your computer. You can always click on these functions to go learn about them inside of P5JS's references. But as I walk down this basics, we've now learned about a typical sketch. We learned how to comment code and turn it on and off. We're starting to learn about primitive shapes. And now this is about styling. So what's really important is code runs from top to bottom. So when I look at my code, everything that's written here, the computer is gonna read it from top to bottom. So especially inside of the draw, it's gonna go from top to bottom. So if I wanna stylize my rectangle before I draw my rectangle, I should style it. So I could say fill, and then I have an, I have an option I could give a shade of gray from zero. It's so it's black, we can't see it. 150 is a shade of gray. All the way up to 255 is white. So on the description here, we have, or rather on the cheat sheet, also down here, I have it setting the fill. One color is grayscale, three colors is RGB. Two colors is grayscale plus alpha. Four colors is RGB plus alpha. So here I have white and I could say comma 50. And now it's translucent, which if I turn off my background, I can take advantage of the fact that this thing is kind of translucent and I can, I can draw kind of a ghosty image. If I don't want this, we have a stroke on our rectangle, this black outline. To get rid of it, I just write no uppercase stroke. And now I just have this nice soft fill happening. Hopefully that's working for everyone. If I leave it sitting there for a little bit of time, it'll become solid because it's just adding up and adding up and adding up and adding up. Maybe before I get to the mouse fill, is this working for everyone? Is anyone having trouble? It works. 
Great. Anyone out there not? Yeah, so here I can almost create like faux 3D shapes just by just by being patient and drawing some things and waiting for it to run. Ah, maybe while I draw something nice like this, like I like this just kind of traced out imagery. Whenever you have something that you like, press Control S and that will download it. Control S. And that's the same as under the menu. Oh, I didn't even get, I, I got lost and stopped walking through what was at the top here. What I'm doing is under export, I'm pressing take a snapshot. And by default, this should download both a picture that you're drawing. In this case, it's a translucent shape. So this actually has alpha. Um, there's no, we didn't draw a background first. So this is, I could, I could, lay this on top of something else and it has um, alpha channel it also saves a copy of your sketch at that moment and so this way i can i have a i have a snapshot of the code like it was which i could potentially import i could drag and drop in case i take the code somewhere else and i want to bring it back to what i saw what i saw there So control S is a good key to hold on to, to save a screenshot. Okay. Yeah. If we want to use our mouse, so we're using our mouse to, to move this thing. I'm going to get rid of this alpha, get rid of this comma five. And if I wanted to, if I added two more zeros, now I have a red square. Maybe I'll turn the background back on. So I have just a single square. And if I wanted to use my mouse for that shade of red, and I put mouse X, then it works from zero up to 255, but then I'm like, I can't go any more than 255. So I run into a problem that it's just like, it's stuck at, at 255. It's never gonna get more or less. It's not really um, going from like one color to another color from left to right. So we could do things like I could divide the number by 10, for example, would be a, a simple way to, to fix that. It's a, I'm guesstimating, it's maybe not the right number to use. Maybe I try divided by five. This is just sort of a rough guess at, at how I need to change this number. Because maybe something that's good to do is we can debug a value by saying print. So I could say print, mouse X. And now in the bottom of my screen, you should be able to see a number there and it tells you a number that is your mouse X. So there I see it goes from zero up to, on my case, 1910. So what does this print do? Uh, this is also a nice way to use two slashes is to leave comments in your code. So I can leave a comment for myself and I can say debug value, set fill color, remove outline, draw rectangle. You can leave as many of these comments as you need for yourself. Uh, it's a really good way just to also turn on and off a little bit of code. Uh, maybe you leave yourself a comment that says like, second value or I could say comma 15 for whoops I could say comma 15 for translucent shape or for lower for alpha I would call it uh, alpha so I could test out what this number is divided by five and I can see yeah that's pretty good it's going up to 380 so maybe divided by eight Okay, that's pretty, that's closer. There's a much better way that we can do this with something called a map, but we don't, I'm not going to go there quite yet. First, we should play with some other basic shapes.
Any other questions out there? Yeah. Yes, I have a question. Um, how can I print a second value in the console? Yeah, so uh, what were you wanting to print? Like the mouse Y? The, yeah, the mouse Y, just that. Yeah, so, so this little console that I have at the bottom of the screen, it's really intended just for printing one line of text at a time. So there's two things I could do. There's, or there's always five things you could do. I could turn it off and then turn another one on. Or we can combine, uh, this is, so this is a variable, mouse X and Y. These are variables. So right now we're, we're showing ourselves what a variable is with a little bit of math on it. We can combine a variable with normal text by using an addition. So I can say plus in quotes, either single or double quotes, it's up to me. I could put like a dash space and then I could add another variable. So then I could say mouse Y and now I can see two values down at the bottom. That's a way that I can, or I could say, I could give myself a slash slash and say mouse Y and now I'm, I'm like, I can see it really well down in the bottom what that value is. Although it's jumping all around because the X is also jumping, the value is changing a lot. So maybe what I would do is I would just turn it off and just print it separately, print, mouse y and now i'm looking at the y and i know it goes up to a thousand something so maybe i want to divide it by five and now it only goes up to 200 or by four and now it goes up to 250. yeah so maybe i, I do the same here i say mouse y divided by four and now i can control this thing from green to orange to green to red i turn off my background and now I can see what that looks like drawn out on the screen. So I'm almost making a gradient from between two colors by using one of them uses the mouse X, one of them uses the mouse Y, and one value is at the moment at zero. Yeah, cool. That's what I was asking for. Thanks. Yep, you're welcome. There's a, there's a way more professional way that we can do this where we can perfectly map, it's called our mouse, from left to right to the number zero to 255. And we can do that as well now because this is just guessing. Like this is gonna be different on somebody else's screen. If I look at this on a mobile, on a cell phone, it'll be different. If you have a huge screen or a small screen, these numbers won't work because they're gonna be different values. So before, if we want to learn the really fancy way of doing it, which I recommend because it's we use this function all the time. Yeah, so I'm going to save this once because I like this little fancy coloration thingy. Um, and let's make a really professional, a professional way of changing this color. So this is already getting a little fancy, but I think there was enough request to do it. Uh, we can create our own variables. So this is going to be how variables work. These are variables that are built in to P5. There's mouse X, mouse Y. There's this thing called width and height. And we can invent our own ones by just writing a word let. It used to be var is what you would write. But now in newer JavaScript, we write let. And then we can write any word we want, but it shouldn't exist in P5, so it needs to be a new word and no spaces. It should really be a, like a, if we want multiple words, we use what's called camel case, where I could say like let, I'll call this map color. So I'm going to write MAP with a big C color equals, and I'm not going to map it right away. Let's Let's put a random 255 just to show you what this thing's going to do. So I'm I'm inventing a value called map color. It's going to equal a random number from 0 to 255 and then let's plug it in and see what happens. Map color. And now this thing is like spitting out all kinds of weird crazy random from 0 to 255. So we just invented a variable which is Basically, it's creating a custom value that then we can use throughout our code. And I can already use this to make a kind of fun image. I save that. But I don't want to do random. 
what I wanted to do is this thing called map. So I'll, I'll do it once and show you what goes inside of it. And then we'll do it. I'll explain it uh, multiple times because it's it's kind of confusing at first. So this thing called map color is going to be, it's a function called map where it needs five values. It needs to know who comes in, what's the lowest and largest that number will be, and then what do we want it to be? So in this map, I feed it my mouse X is the value that comes into it. This is the number that changes. And then I say comma, what's the lowest that mouse X will be when I'm over here on the left? It is zero because this is known as zero on the page. What's the most that it will be comma? The very right of our page is known as width. And then the next two values are what do I want the number to be? I want it to be zero to 255. And now this thing, if I clear the page, it does a perfect transition from one side to the other of a color. If I get rid of this mouse Y here, so I just have zero, so I can just test red, or maybe I'll make it 255. Then this thing goes from green, perfectly fading to a yellow over here. Basically, I'm bending this number. This mouse X is being bent from one range, zero to width, to a new range, zero to 255. That may or may not make sense. It takes a few times for this thing to make sense. So if I want to do this for the Y, again, we can call these almost anything we want. Um, they just can't be a word that already exists as another function. So maybe I'm going to, I'm going to change the name of this. Maybe do this with me. I'm going to change map color to say map R for the red map R for the red. So I just changed that value from map color to map R. And now I can do a second one and I'll say let map RG is a map. And let's do the Y for this one, mouse Y. So the X is left to right, the Y is top to bottom. And what is the least that our mouse Y can be? What's the lowest number it will be? I'd say zero. Yep, that's correct. What's the largest our mouse Y will be? If we put it way down here at the bottom. Uh, yep, height. It's the same, it's similar to our mouse X, but it's based on zero to height instead of zero to width. And now we get to decide what the output numbers are. They can be anything. We're basically bending this number that goes from zero to height. In my case, it's like zero to a thousand or so to any new number. It doesn't have to be a, a small to big number. It could be a big to small number. It could be a negative number to positive number. It could be anything. So maybe instead of zero to 255, I'll do 255 to zero. So it's kind of working the opposite as the other one. And now we can invent a value and now we need to use it. So instead of 255 here, I type map G. And now if I'm at the top, it's green. If I go to the bottom, it's kind of red. If I put my mouse over here, it's a dark green. If I put my mouse over here, it's a bright orange. Up here, it's a yellow. And now this is similar to our previous sketch. It looks very similar, I think, except it's perfectly responsive to our mouse. We're not doing any guess math like we were before. Before we were like guesstimating divide by eight, four, but like this, it's it's perfectly stretching those numbers to colors. Questions, any questions on that? Can you quickly explain how the color works? Because I don't really understand how we have these particular colors. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, let's let's explain color by doing another shape. We have this rectangle. Let's draw another shape constantly. And then we'll also get an understanding of how the code is running from top to bottom and what happens when you put code before or after other code. So again, 
code is going top to bottom. So if I put a fill color here and say, hey, this should be this fancy color, but on the next line, I'm going to, I'll just show you what happens. If I say fill 255, now I have an eraser because I'm, I'm overruling this line of code with this line of code. So this doesn't even matter because this is the last line of code that it sees for a fill before it draws the shape. So I'm going to get rid of that line of code. I just wanted to show you how we can overrule our decisions. And I'm going to go down a couple lines of code. I want to stay in front of this curly bracket. But let's draw an ellipse. Or actually, we don't need to draw an ellipse. Let's draw a circle. No, I take it back. Let's draw an ellipse because it's good to get used to this, this special word, ellipse, with two L's. And an ellipse is like a circle, but it can be an oval if we give it uh, four values. It needs to know, I look at the cheat sheet, under shapes, primitive shapes, we have line, which needs two X and Y values. We have a rectangle, which we've used so far, and we have an ellipse, which works very similar. So I tell it where to be. I want to be in the center of the screen. So I want to draw an ellipse right in the middle of the screen. Does someone have an idea how we could do this? If we know this is zero, this is width way over here, how can we get the center of the screen? Half the width? Yep, half the width. So we could say width divided by two. So that says be this full value split in half puts us in the center comma and then how do we do the same vertically height divided by two <laughs> yep height divided by two and now let's draw it an actual size let's make 200 and see what happens there it is there so i can see this circle hanging out in the center and it's currently let me make it even bigger uh, instead of being 200 i could make the thing based on my screen. It's really good to make things responsive. Instead of being 200, which might be too big or too small, why don't we do height divided by three, for example? Or as I had it at height, now I have a huge circle that basically is showing us like the color field that we're in, but I'm gonna make it smaller. I'm gonna say divided by three. Okay, so now we have this we have this circle that's sitting in the center of our page. It's currently the same fill as what we're drawing. But let's experiment with fill now here. So if I say fill 255, this thing is white. If I say zero, it'll be black. If I say 127, it'll be a shade of gray. 187, it'll be lighter, 197. So all of our colors by default in RGB go from zero to 255. Zero to 255. A quick note, just so you know, in JavaScript, we don't have to have these semicolons that I've been putting at the end of the lines of code. It's it's totally up to you. It's style. It, some programming languages say you have to have this semicolon, so it could be confusing if you don't use it and you switch to another language. In JavaScript, it doesn't have to have it, but it doesn't hurt to have it. There's a few times we have to have it, and I'll point them out, but most of the time we don't. So the fill, let me go to the cheat sheet real quick, how the fill is working. So we give it one value, it's grayscale, 0 to 255. If we give it three values, it's RGB. If we give it four values, it's an alpha channel on top of it. So I could mix a custom color here. I could say I want zero. If I want blue, I could say zero for red, zero for green, 255 for blue. Or if I want to mix in some green, I could say 255. And now I have a light, I have like a cyan or 155, or I use that variable I've invented up above and I say map G, I use it again, and now I can adjust 
the shade of color based on the mouse is being used. So whenever we make variables, a big reason why we invent variables is to use them a bunch of times in our code and have it be based on the same thing. So this is with RGB. If I give one more value, it'll be alpha. And so now like this, look, I can sort of see it for a second and then it covers it up because I'm my circle. If I make it just five, it's like slowly covering up whatever I had drawn there. Or 15 maybe, so it really can cover it up. And now I can kind of see the stuff and then eventually it covers it up. If there's no opacity, then what happens? We never get to see our rectangle because we're always drawing a circle on top of it because of the order of drawing. So it's drawing our, our rectangle and then we're always drawing a ellipse on top of it. If I want this to be grayscale, then just get rid of these values. So I could have 150, a shade of gray. If I want a translucent shade of gray, comma 50. And now it's like a kind of see-through shade of gray. I can make it bigger by saying height divided by two. And now I can kind of see the square in front of it. Did that make sense? Are there other questions about how Phil is working? Um, I'm having a small trouble. Uh, um, after I thought that the ellipse things just stopped to appear. So if I turn it off, uh, it works well. Like it okay. was working. But if I add the ellipse, I just don't see anything. Well, uh, one shape appears at the beginning, and then it's just. Okay. Yeah, let's double check. There might be a typo in here. Double walk through the ellipse and double check first for spelling that there's two L's. Yeah. Double check your width. This gets people all the time the DTH, that that's in the right order or height, GHT. This always gets people. All right. Yeah, that's what happened. Just, yep. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people uh, first starting out, especially if it's not a mother tongue, uh, will write height with like a TH. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this gets people all the time. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions out there? I'm wondering uh, how the how it works that code I, I don't know how even to explain that this ellipse now that it has this exact fill and not rectangle takes this fill. I don't know if you can understand, but Totally. Yeah. Yep. So what's really important is our draw. Again, the draw is looping 60 times a second. So it's repeating, 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 repeating. And any instructions that we write apply to, like if we set the fill, it applies to the shapes coming after it, and it would apply to the shape at the top of the fill or the draw when it re repeats. But what's happening is here we set the fill once, and that's affecting this rectangle. And then we change our mind and say be gray, and that affects this circle. And then the code loops and goes back to the top of the draw. It changes the fill back to this color, and then it draws the rectangle and changes it back. So it keeps changing, changing, changing. If I turn off this fill, so here I have a green background. I turn off this fill. Now my rectangle is also gray. Why? Because it was turned gray here. It drew the circle, it repeated the code, nothing told it not to be gray. So then my rectangle is gray. Okay, I get it now, thanks. Yep, so we, it's like anytime we, we tell it what to do for one kind of style, we might need to change, we might need to explicitly write another instruction to say, okay, stop doing that, now do this. Okay, stop doing that, now do this. We just get to keep changing our mind, changing our mind. I might have one question. It's not really related. Is it possible somehow to change the amount of times the screen is refreshing in, in the seconds? I mean, you said it's like being refreshed about 60 times per second. Can we make yeah. like 30, 20 or something? Sure. Yeah, you could do it in the draw, but this makes sense to do in your setup. So again, what's the difference of the setup and draw? Setup executes code once. So if you if you want to do something that the that doesn't need to be 
told, telling the computer constantly to, to change, then it's good to put it in the setup. And if you want to slow down how often it repeats, this is known as the frame rate. And then we could say something like 24 is maybe common for animation. Change um, speed of draw loops. And now if I move my if I move my mouse, I can tell the difference. This thing is a bit more yeah. spaced out. Yeah, mm -hmm. if I turn it off, it's super smooth. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Which and how do you yeah. clear the board of the yeah, I'm doing a trick all the time. So normally to, to clear the board, we would maybe set up a, a, a special function saying if I press my mouse or if I press delete, what I'm doing is I'm pressing control enter to just recompile. And okay. if I don't if I don't change my code, it does a hard recompile which clears everything. Yeah, so then I can draw a little bit and I can just press control enter to a hard a hard recompile. I just wanted to also clarify. So this thing with colors, it uh, works the same for layers. That's why we see ellipse on top, right? Yeah. So, so technically, we're not using layers yet. That's something we can get into: is to draw to a layer. But definitely, uh, our code runs from top to bottom. So we're seeing our ellipse always on top of the rectangle because we're telling the computer, uh, if you can see my webcam, draw a rectangle draw an ellipse and then the code repeats and then it's like draw a rectangle draw an ellipse draw a rectangle draw an ellipse and our ellipse is always sitting on top so for a split second it's there but then before we can see anything it's being covered by the ellipse so we can change that if you select the code and move it up above i can say command x or control x and then i would put it uh i would move some space because we need this, these values up here. We're using these values. Oh no, I was. Now I'm going to put my ellipse in front, and look what happens. Now I can, if I run the code again, no, actually it doesn't make a difference. It's actually looking very similar because of, of how solid the shape is. Maybe that's not such a great example. Maybe I put it back how it was. I'll show you the example by copying the ellipse. Let's, let's duplicate our ellipse and move one of them plus 100 and then change the fill of it fill 0 0 255 there so i have a blue one this is kind of what i wanted to demonstrate now i have a second ellipse sitting on top of the gray ellipse and we can see that it's covering up the gray ellipse because it comes after it so it's like it's yeah it's almost inverted the code is going top to bottom but the shapes are from bottom to top so if I move these lines of code in front of the other ellipse, now the blue is on top, uh, rather the gray is on top. It just has this translucency there. I can make it more and more solid so that we can see the gray. Now by changing these numbers, we can, we can see through it a little bit or not at all. Now the gray is on top. I put it below. Now the blue is on top. So this is the difference of order of, of code, who shows up on top. Other questions about this fill and shapes? Um, could you explain the map value or function again? I didn't quite get definitely the yeah, date. Yeah, and you're definitely not the only one, I bet. Let me, I'm going to open up, I have a special little function inside of um, P5 Live called a chalkboard, which I'll use to try to explain this thing again. So I always think of the map as a funnel, like this. We have these things called a funnel, which we use to like pour water into a little jar. This is a pretty crappy drawing of it, but there, it looks something like this. And we maybe, we pour stuff in, and then it turns into something else and comes out as this other value. 
And the advantage of a funnel is if we put it on top of a bottle, we can like uh, move the liquid far from left to right, but it comes out in this little stream. And what the map does is it needs five values. It needs to know who is coming in, what's the value coming in. It needs to know what's the least and the most, what's the min and the max or the low and high of that value, and what's the new low and high. So if I'm using my mouse X, let's say my mouse is 50, and the lowest my mouse will ever be is zero, the most it's ever going to be is width. And I wanted to use this thing for a color, so I said zero to 255. So this number 50 gets automatically manipulated to change from this range to this range, from zero to width to zero to 255. And I can I can demonstrate this with also with like some values. I can quickly show you. I'm gonna make a background. You don't need to do this. I'm just gonna quickly set up something so that we can see some values. Whoops, text size, text align, center, center. Okay. Um, high, zero, zero, width, height. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate what a map is doing with with some with a like a value debugger here. So if we have, uh, I'll call it let. I'll say let val equal fifty. This was this example. Fifty is coming in, and then I say let map val equal a map and some value comes into the map that's going to be val and we need to know what the low and high of val is so in the case of our mouse x we said it was from zero to width and we wanted to use it as a color so we said zero to 255 and now let's see what that value is if i change high to map val it's a crazy long number uh, because it's a really, really precise decimal number. So let me make this just 100. There we go. It's 6.6614, da, 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 da. I would have no idea how to calculate that myself, or I wouldn't want to. It's a crazy little algorithm. But basically, if this is my mouse coordinate, it's automatically converting it from where it is on the width to this shade of gray. If I wanted to use this for a stroke size, maybe I want to use this for... Um, Let's make a stroke that's blue. There should be a stroke. We haven't learned this yet, but stroke weight. If I say five, there we go. You can kind of see it. Let me make it brighter. There it is. It's even brighter. Um, I know I'll say no fill. So we just see the outline. There we go. So I'm making, um, I have a stroke that can go like size one, size 0.5, or it could become 25 and be really thick. That's too thick. If I wanted to use this value for my stroke weight, um, it might be too big. If 50, if instead of using 50, but I was using like my mouse X, then I could quickly get, it's actually kind of cool, but I could get way too big a stroke because that means this stroke out here is 255. That's way too big. But I maybe want this mapped value to go from zero to width and actually just go from 0.5 to five. And now on the very left, it's really thin. On the right, it's only five. So that's my, my old low and high and my new low and high. That's how map is working. And you feed it anything. It could be, it could be the mouse. It could be the volume of a microphone, whatever sound coming in, you might want to map that. It could be, it's for data visualization. I might be getting data from um, from the internet, that's that's like, who knows what the data is about? It could be like everyone's favorite number in this class, and then I I know I get take the lowest number and the highest number, and then I plot a little chart and stretch the numbers. Or, um, yeah, there's there's a ton of different use cases when we play with this thing and and map things out. It's especially used for distribution. 
If I loop and create 20 objects, I can use map to automatically place them across the page without having to figure out what the divisions are. Yeah, so we use it for color, we use it for, I'll plug it in here, map. If I say map val, it, the color doesn't really change because this value is only going from 0.5 to 15 right now. So that's not very useful. That's why we create a bunch of these things and, and call them what we're doing with them. So here I say, I would say map stroke weight, and then I might plug that in here, map stroke weight. And then I might create another one and say map color that goes from zero to 255. And then I use that map color here. Uh, and then I need to spit out one of those numbers. There's the map color. It's going from zero up to 255. Or I spit out the other value. Stroke weight is going from zero up to 15. Yeah, I just changed it really quick into doing two different things. Instead of that generic map val, you create as many of these maps as you need and give them names for where you apply it and where this context belongs. Questions about mapping, this demonstration of mapping? Yeah, we'll be playing with them quite a bit. I uh, go back to my sketch that I have here. Yeah, so this map we're using here, we're feeding it the mouse X or mouse Y. We make sure that we tell it the right low and high of that value, and then we give it new values, how we want to use it. Any questions? Let's set the stroke on one of these shapes. We've turned off the stroke up here. Here we said no stroke, so nothing else has a stroke. A stroke is an outline. And maybe I don't want a stroke on this first one, but on the second one, I want a stroke. It works just like fill. You get to assign a color. Grayscale, RGB, alpha, whatever you want. And now just this one shade, this one shape has a white outline. And like I showed you, there's stroke weight for how thick should it be? Five, 15. And we can see this ellipse has no fill, no stroke, because it's still part of this instruction that says no stroke for this rectangle and this ellipse. And then there is a stroke for this one. And maybe I bring the opacity back down so we can see through it a bit. That's kind of nice that we can see this one is almost like a little lens sitting on top of the blue one behind it. And maybe before we take our lunch, just before we take a break for lunch, I just show you, I demonstrated it when we were sitting in the room together. Random is a really fun thing to play with to let the computer decide stuff for you. When we play with random, uh, I'll show you on the cheat sheet. It should be on here under random. We have two options. We give one value and that's always zero up to that value or we give two values and that's the low and the high of our random. So if I want to use it for the stroke color, I could say random 255. And now this thing is like freaking out and giving me all kinds of shades of color. Or I could say 200 comma, and now it's just kind of flickering. It almost looks like a neon flicker because this is now a random number from 200 to 255. It has like a limited range. If we want color, <clears throat> then we just need to add more values, comma, 255, comma, 255. Or we use random for one of those values. Uh, maybe I'll put zero on one of them. Yeah, you could use random multiple times. I could say random 255. 
And now this thing is also kind of freaking out. So I'll say zero to, to 50. And now I have like a little bit of random of these colors, not necessary. You just have to remember if you want to use um, random as a color, you need to use it multiple times. So here I'll say random 255. And now I'm getting pulsing colors of blue back there. Random 255. Random 255. If I want like total random rainbow, uh, then all RGB need to be random. But this is maybe going to hurt your eyes. So I'm going to make that thing smaller. And is this possible that uh, we say that the value shouldn't be random between the range, but the random between like set of numbers? Like for example, 100 and 200? Yeah, exactly. So for any of these, we could say 100, 200. Maybe this one I say 0 to 100. Whoops, 100. And then maybe this one is 50. And now it's going to be, let me make the thing bigger again. And now it's like just a certain type of random. Okay. There is, I mean, there, there's so many interesting different ways uh, we can play with with a little bit of math. We can use, uh, later we can learn about sign, which is like a, a pendulum to change color. We can use noise, is like random, but like smart random, parallel noise. It's like slowly changing a value. Or one other thing, let me show you real quick. Let's get rid of this random color. Go back to 255. And let's put um, frame count percentage sign in front of it. And you'll see what's happening here. This thing is like fading in and then starting over. What does frame count do? Frame count, this is the last thing I show and then I'll, we'll take a lunch break. If I print, frame count down in the bottom here you'll see a number that's just growing and growing right now mine is up to like 182,000. that's how many times my draw has repeated since i've had this open in p5 live this number continues growing continues growing so that if you recompile recompile your your everything that's built on this number keeps working like that why do we use this number? It's it's basically the counter of our sketch running. And what this percentage sign does, it's called modulo. It's a nice way of limiting that number. So basically, if I if I print this number percentage 255, now this number, instead of being this big crazy number, you can watch it count up to 255 and then start over. It goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 5, 5, 255 and starts over. Without it, it's this huge number, almost 190,000. But this percentage, it's called modulo. Uh, percentage is modulo, is basically the remainder. It's it's asking feed, try to divide this number into this number and tell me what's left over. That's like the kind of complicated way of thinking about it. The simple way of thinking about it is saying, whatever number is on the left side, limit it by this number. So this number is allowed to be zero up to this number. Once it gets too big, it goes back down to zero. So what else could we do with this thing? We could use it here for the position of the circle. I could say frame count modulo width, and now this circle is moving across our page, limited by the width. So watch what happens. This thing is gonna move across the page quite slowly, and when it hits the width, it's going to be limited by the width, and it's going to jump back to the left side of our page. Okay. I have a small question here. Uh, can we control the speed of counting the frames? Definitely. So, so this value that we're printing down here, um, or I put width for this printing value, it's growing just one at a time. It's growing at 60, 60 frames a second. 
So that's because I put my uh, so I turned the same with the frame rate also. Yeah. No, no, because if we if we slowed it down here, then we'll get really blocky animation. So instead, we can manipulate this number to slow it down or speed it up. So I could say times point oh one, and now watch how slow this number grows. Now it's like three point five, four point five. Or if I want to speed it up, I say times 10. And now it goes really fast. So that was just printing out the value. If I do it here, ellipse times 10. Now this thing is moving pretty fast across the screen. It's moving 10 times as fast. Or 20 times as fast. Or 0.1. And now the thing is going to move super slow across the page. You can just barely see it moving there. So yeah, so we can we can manipulate this value that's being limited by the width by by multiplying oh. by a big or small number. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe 0.5 is a nice speed. It's going fairly fast, making it across the page. If I want the colors. To, to cycle quicker, I could change this number that's dedicated to the fill. I could say times 20. And now this thing is going to be a little crazy, chaotic, but it looks kind of cool. It's changing the color that often, or times 10. Hopefully no one is epileptic in here, otherwise I'll stop flashing shapes. I could say 0.5 or 0.1 to really slow the thing down so that it, it takes way longer to change color. But there I barely notice it. This is maybe nice if I used it for the background. Then I could have the background slowly turn from black to white, and then it starts over. But this is known, what we're doing now is known as like a, a saw wave. It goes up, 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 and then it crashes down, and then it goes up, 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 up. There are other type of waves that we can play with that do like nice, smoother transitions. Yeah, and if I want this to be color, this is one value. So that's why it's gray. If you want color, add two more values, and now we'll have shades of color. When you don't like code, eh, not that you don't like code, when you want to stop drawing other shapes, just comment them out. Put two lines in front of the rectangle, in front of the other circle. And now we just have this shape. It's really good just to turn code on and off to test things out. And maybe I want to see what this looks like full screen. So I stopped dividing by two, and now I get to draw a huge, a huge circle. Or I use frame count here as well. Frame count modulo height. This frame count is super fun. We'll, we'll play with it a lot. Um, and so now the size is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes by. Because I'm this frame count percentage, you can use so much in your code to make all kinds of wild animation happening because it's just changing a number over time. Questions, any questions? Um, I've got a quick one. Is it possible to stop it? Like uh, it's going, but we want like to pause it. Yep. So how we can do that? Yeah, uh, in P5 Live, we can press Control P to pause everything. So that's one way to, to stop things is just Control P pauses the rendering engine. Or we can just turn off our shape and now nothing is drawing, and it's like we paused. I turned off all the shapes, and we can't see anything running right now. What we sometimes do is we right. eventually maybe would set up a, a button or so to say, like, if only if I'm pressing spacebar, then it's allowed to run. Or if I don't press spacebar, it can't run. You can do things like that. Yeah, but for now, Control-P can pause it. If you want to pause it and get a screenshot, or if you just turn off the code for a second, 
then it stops drawing anything. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question about looping. Uh -huh. uh, now it's like going to 255 and then like starting back at zero, but is there any possibility to like go um, backwards from 255 to 54 and, and so on? Definitely. That's the, this loop effect. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I just write down the hint of what you need, but um, we don't have time to go into it yet, but we can look into it um, hopefully later today. Sign is the function that you want to be investigating. Yeah, maybe during the lunch break, um, if you want to eat and learn, um, just so you know, in P5 Live, at the top of the menu, there's this little booklet, and this is the reference section. It takes a second to load. And I have the P5 references. So these are normally on p5js.org. Reference. This is where you can learn all about every function that P5.js has. But I have this built in here so that we don't have to change tabs. And I could go search for sign. There's a thing called sign. And this uh, gives me a little input on how to play with sign. It calculates the sign of an angle. I don't know if this is a very nice example or not. Uh, let me just paste and see what happens. Uh, that's doing this crazy thing up here. That's not so useful. Yeah, I'll show you later how we can play with sign. Otherwise, you will also find it um, on the website. But sign is what you'd want to use to get this sort of pendulum-like movement. 